Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity with your host, Lawrence Neal. Good evening, ladies and gents. It's Lawrence here, your host of Corporate Warrior. It is late evening in London, UK at the moment, and I'm absolutely exhausted, so I'm standing so I can inject or try and inject some enthusiasm into this uh, introduction. Um, Welcome to Corporate Warrior. This is the podcast that gives you advice from some of the greatest minds in the world in exercise, nutrition, and human performance to help you get stronger, perform better, and stay healthy. The guests on this show include Dr. Doug McGuff, Ben Greenfield, Steve Maxwell, Drew Bay, Bill De Simone, Skylar Tanner, and many, many more. And as you may know, this podcast is all about bringing on truly the best minds that I can find um, on all things related to exercise, health, fitness, nutrition, etc. Um, I'm very particular about who I get on the show and it's very important to me that the people that come on really do add value to, to my listeners. And, and as I said, the, the key theme of my podcast is really to give people the, the tools, the tactics, the strategies to optimize their, their performance and their results. In this interview, I had the very good fortune of interviewing John Little. John Little is the co-author of Body by Science alongside Dr. Doug McGuff. So as you can imagine, this was a real treat for me. Um, Quick bio on John. He's a physical trainer, researcher, writer in the field of martial arts. Um, In fact, I won't go on too much because I do actually introduce him and say all of this stuff. But what's really interesting about John is he's incredibly knowledgeable about exercise um, and has wrote and, and, and uh, published and, and helped publish many books on the, on the topic. But he's also one of the foremost authorities on Bruce Lee and, and Will Durant. So he's a very, um, very interesting guy, very interesting background. Uh, you know, the sort of topics that we cover in this one include um, sort of Bruce Lee and the impact that Bruce Lee had on, um, on John in terms of, you know, training inspiration um, he's a, had a very very close relationship with Mike Mensa which is very very fascinating and we get into some real um, kind of private moments that he had with Mike um, which were just fascinating um, and you really kind of get a, a good insight into Mike's mind on this one um, following on from that we get into nutrition um, which is always a difficult uh, conversation because it's such a controversial topic uh, and John shares his views on that um, we get into to, to work out protocols and we really get into some depth on kind of the nitty gritty and high intensity training um, and I really try and pick John's John's brains on what he feels is you know the best way to train and excuse me and get the most out of your workouts um, and yeah and that's that's kind of the the key kind of topics that we touch on although we do kind of go on random tangents um but this was a a fantastic conversation john is a just a great guy and i was very very uh, fortunate to have him on the show um thank you again for for listening and continue to listening to this podcast i really appreciate it and please do pop over to itunes and leave a review as that helps me out in a big way enjoy the show and i'll talk to you soon all the best You are a physical trainer, researcher, and a writer in the field of martial arts, bodybuilding, and physical conditioning. Some of your most notable works include Body by Science, which you co-authored with Dr. Doug McGuff, Max Contraction, The High Intensity Training, The Mike Mentor Way, and The Art of Expressing the Human Body. You are considered to be one of the foremost authorities on Bruce Lee and the only person authorized by the Bruce Lee estate to review the entirety of Bruce Lee's personal notes, sketches, and reading annotations. Now, this is Wikipedia, so please correct me if any of this is incorrect. (laughs) Furthermore, you founded and head up the Will Durant Foundation which is an effort to keep Durant's ideas and thoughts alive in the modern era. John Little, welcome to Corporate Warrior. Well, thank you very much, Lawrence. My pleasure to be here. No worries. Bit of a strange start to the interview, but I just wanted to ask you um, some questions around Bruce Lee that I find quite interesting. Um, I've spoken to a number of uh, high-intensity advocates who really kind of admired Bruce Lee. Um, I don't know, maybe that's because of their generation or um, or what, but it's, it's interesting to me because Bruce Lee had quite an ectomorphic physique. He wasn't a big guy. So, so why is it that um, you think that you, you kind of the your peers in, in the industry really admired Bruce Lee and his physique. Uh, that's a good question. It was one that uh, 
when I wrote the first article on Bruce Lee for Muscle and Fitness magazine many, many years ago, the opposition I got from the editors in chief were that, well, why would we want to do something on Bruce Lee? I mean, what did he weigh? 130 pounds? Uh, <laughs> Uh, what could that you know? What could you say about him, or what could he have to offer people that are interested in building you know tremendous amounts of muscle? And uh, it was put to me that if I could get some of the top champions of the time to say yes, they would like to read about his training methods, then I would get the green light to do the article. And so I polled all of the bodybuilders uh, that I knew at the time, and to a person, they all said, "Oh yeah, Bruce Lee's physique." was one of the major inspirations for getting me into bodybuilding, among them Lou Ferrigno, who mm-hmm. is, of course, carries a massive amount of muscle. But they liked the quality of his physique. They liked uh, the incredibly uh, defined appearance of Bruce Lee uh, presented on the screen. And uh, I also think in every bodybuilder, there is a, uh, as Arthur Jones used to call them, little boy in a gorilla suit. We like the idea of being able to totally take care of ourselves and the muscle that Bruce Lee had on his body was put there or developed expressly for that purpose and he was a very capable individual in that regard and he had a great physique. I think were you to poll the average person on the street and put up a picture of Bruce Lee's physique and that of the current Mr. Olympia, hands down they would go, they would prefer Bruce Lee's physique. Yeah, yeah. that's a good answer. Um, you obviously know uh, Bruce Lee's um, story very, very well, I'm sure. Um, well, uh, did he do anything unique to achieve his physique, or was it largely down to genetics? Or what were the details around that? Well, actually, there's nothing. <laughs> it, it's, it'll probably be a familiar refrain throughout our dialogue today, but no, nothing, nothing magical, nothing special, very basic. Uh, when it came to resistance training, very basic uh, resistance training principles. Uh, he had a very active mind, so he was constantly sifting through the information that was available in the late 1960s, early 1970s, and there wasn't a lot. Most of it came via the muscle magazines. So he, But he had a pretty critical mind. He'd look for common denominators in certain champions training programs and try to incorporate that into his own programs. But essentially his program is about as basic as the one that came with your first barbell set. <laughs> Why does that not surprise me? Yeah. <laughs> no, that's really cool. Um, I know this is going to be hard for you to answer, but what uh, of everything you've learned about Bruce Lee in his life, um, what were the were there any key takeaways, um, like key few few kind of lessons that you learned that you could pass on to others? Wow, um, there's Bruce Lee is like the Marianas Trench uh, in terms of depth to answer that. Uh, <laughs> And I've written several books. His philosophy in particular appealed to me. And I think now it might be more relevant than ever, given how the East and the West have moved so close together now. Um, I think it, it, it behooves us in the West to understand the ways of the East and the thought patterns of those in the East. But really what his, I guess the takeaway from Bruce Lee is, was in his personal motto, which was using no way as way, having no limitation as limitation. He believed that if you locked yourself into a certain way of doing things that all growth thereafter uh, ceases. You had to be open. You had to be able to adapt to changing circumstances. He applied that in fighting. But I think um, from what I've learned in in the field of exercise, I think that's a valid principle there as well. Uh, Although I may not have thought that five years ago. uh, I think now with a lot of the research on genetics, with our species uh, almost innate desire or or predilection to conserve energy, that you can't lock yourself into one way of training, for example, and expect that to yield results in perpetuity. It will for a time. And then, as we all have experienced, it's your body stops responding. That could be largely a genetic component, but it could also be simply your body implementing its, its uh, innate desire to conserve energy. If that makes sense. Yeah, I think it does. But I'd like to pry a little deeper on that. So, if you take the, if you take the example of the Big Five, um, so so would that be an example? Let's say you do the Big Five for a, one year and you plateau on that workout, and then you, you it then must uh, sort of further uh, progression necessitates uh, you know either a change in protocol, like doing you know max contraction or rest pause or something like that, um, or and or a split. Is that relevant? I, that, that certainly would be a valid approach to dealing with it. In the big picture, and this is 
merely a hypothesis at this point. And I think Doug would back me at least up until my conclusion, perhaps, um, (laughs) that uh, we are a species that face starvation on a daily basis up until the turn of the last century, with the result that energy acquisition and preservation was paramount for our survival. Consequently, two attitudes, if you will, formed in us. And, And one was, if you happen upon energy, food, consume it, because it may not be there tomorrow. Second attitude was, if you don't have to output large amounts of energy, don't, because you may not get it back. So fast forwarding from a time when our ancestors would have been lucky to get 800 to 1,000 calories a day out of their environment to present day, we live in an environment of food abundance. As soon as you and I conclude this interview, we can go five minutes away and put 3,000 calories down our throat if we so chose. So we have a desire to consume energy and we have a very strong disinclination to output large amounts of energy, which is why when when an exercise gets difficult, when you're tapping fast twitch fibers, every impulse is screaming in you to stop it, terminate the set. And yet, for those who say they like to burn calories, that's the one moment where you're actually burning a considerable amount of calories. So this attitude, if we can extrapolate, means that your body's mechanism to conserve energy is always at play. It doesn't matter what you do. When I lift a coffee cup, uh, my body's going to figure out a way to do that with less energy output. The first time you drove a standard automobile, you may have been exhausted. Uh, Every muscle was tight. Uh, You you were on edge. You were constantly checking the mirrors. You had to work the clutch. You had to work the stick shift, uh, keep your eye on the road, all of that stuff. And when you finished your first drive, you may have been felt like you just finished a workout uh, and probably never wanted to do it again. But you did, and you did it again, and you did it again, and you did it again, and eventually your body learned to synchronize its neural firing with what muscles were required at just the right second so that you didn't have to put 100% muscular effort into the activity. You only had to put in what was required when it was required. And that's the way the body conserves energy, but it does that with everything. Uh, people who run, for example, will, uh, at least where I live in Canada, where we have pretty harsh winters, they will uh, go on a treadmill in the winter months, and they feel that they've maintained their cardiovascular conditioning quite well until they do their first road run in the spring, and then it feels like they've never run before. <laughs> and But they do it again, and they do it again. But the first road run of the spring, you know, their heart's going like a trip hammer, their perspiration's flowing freely, their muscles are aching, their breathing is labored. Um, but they do it again, they do it again, and lo and behold, a month later, that same distance run in the same fashion fails to produce the same effect physiologically. And it's not that their heart and lungs have improved, but what has happened is the first time you did it, your body hasn't quite figured out what you're doing. It, it doesn't know that you're not in danger. It just knows that it's, the demands made on its energy systems have suddenly spiked. So it throws everything it's got at the activity. Every muscle in the neighborhood contributes, and the heart and lungs have to service the working of 100% of that tissue. A month later, it's figured it out. So now it's the heart and lungs service the working of perhaps 25% of the tissue, and consequently, your uh, you know your your pulse rate is uh, not as severe uh, as it was prior. Your muscles don't ache, and if you repeat the same distance in the same time, it has little to no effect. But that doesn't mean that you've had a cardiovascular improvement necessarily. What it means is simply your body's conservation of energy mechanism has come to play, and lo and behold, you're not outputting as much energy. And I think that can be applied to any form of training that you do. If you're doing, for example, the protocol that we um, present in Body by Science, which is the baseline program is essentially a super slow program. It's very good. It's very effective. And, and it may well be the best program for a while. But as soon as that mechanism kicks in, it's, it's not going to be as effective as it was. So that's why, I mean, in our book, we made the point that the, the, the stimulus is a multifactorial process. There's many elements to it. We likened it to spokes on a bicycle wheel. And it's okay to travel down those various spokes, negative only higher repetitions, intervals, uh, pick it, whatever you want to do. And that will represent that same novel stimulus that the runner experiences when he has a spring run, and it's an all-in attitude from the body and its muscular and support systems, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. It does. Um, So 
Okay, just to make sure I understand this. So in the context of, let's say, you're doing Big Five and your goal is to get the best adaptive response possible, i.e. You know, uh, lean gains. Um, right. So are you saying that, you know, I, I could brilliantly explained, by the way, in terms of how the body adapts to specific activities. Um, so are you saying that the, you, you're, you'll get, your body will get so used to the Big Five that you will suddenly con, con, um, conserve a lot more energy during yeah. the exercises so that thereafter thereafter that workout during recovery you don't get the same response therefore you have to you yeah have to and change. I, I, I think and, and there may be a limit to what you can do but I mean certainly there's a genetic limit anyway but you got to remember that your body could care less about your building muscle and in fact it doesn't want you to build muscle that has zero survival value other than to get you to food uh, from the body's perspective so to build an inordinate amount of muscle tissue the body just simply doesn't get that. And anything it does is about survival. And acquisition and preservation of energy is absolutely crucial to survival. Having a 20-inch arm is not. In fact, it could be a liability, you know. And so, you know, we know that you can't stimulate into growth fibers that are not recruited. So when you do a, a different protocol, and you've probably experienced this yourself, if you deviate to uh, uh, a protocol that uh, you haven't done before. You're unbelievably drained and sore after you do it. And I remember training clients at the gym, and I was, I mean, I was about as fundamentalist as you can be on uh, high-intensity training. And we didn't use a lot of sets. We never trained people more than once a week. We kept very accurate progress charts, and everybody was getting stronger, stronger, stronger. Winter came. And these clients would go out skiing because they enjoyed skiing. And they'd come back and report how sore they were. And I would get the question, I thought I was stronger. You know, I went out and my legs were killing me and I couldn't stay on the slopes that long. And I had to scratch my head over that because they were stronger. I had hard data that showed that they were stronger. But what I hadn't ca calculated into my matrix was that conservation of energy syndrome. That skiing represented an entirely new stimulus to them. So the body was all in when they did it. Had they gone back and, and skied again the next day and the next day and the next day, that same syndrome would have manifested and they could have enjoyed the benefits of the increased strength that they had. But when you're all in, when you're hundred percent in, you know, that fuse burns out really quick, but eventually you learn to extend the burn time on that. Uh, the more you do an activity. Yeah. And I guess, um, you could also say that if they never did the strength training in the first place, they'd have even harder time. They probably wouldn't even be oh, able to ski in the first place. <laughs> uh, yeah, they'd probably be bedridden for a couple of weeks. You know? <laughs> exactly. But, uh, it's only at that point that the increased strength really makes a big difference. That and, and helping to prevent an injury. But anytime you're exposed to a, to a new stimulus, your body has yet to figure out how to do it with less energy. So you always have a bigger muscular involvement, a bigger drain on the support systems of the musculature, and consequently a, a greater effect initially. And um, it's like the old Chinese adage that the perfect is the destroyer of the good. You can have the best program you can and i believe me i've racked over the decades i've racked my brain to come up with the best program you know the safest the the one that's going to recruit the most muscle fibers uh, you're going to pay attention to your recovery you're going to pay attention to your nutrition and you've got it all dialed in and there's a check mark in every box and this is the ideal program and it will be for a while and then that syndrome kicks in and it's not nearly as productive as it once was how often do you change your programs Geez, that depends now. Um, I, I, now that I'm aware of this mechanism at play, um, I'm probably not as uh, militant about not changing my programs as I was. I, I, uh, that, that's where the Bruce Lee component comes in, you know, using no way is way to some extent, although I do follow always um, fundamental principles of, I guess, what we'd call high-intensity training. The workouts are intense enough to be meaningful to recruit enough fibers. If they are intense enough to recruit enough fibers, they're going to be comparatively brief. And since fast twitch fibers don't share the same recovery profile as slow twitch fibers, they're going to be relatively infrequent. So I still train once a week. I do train intensely. My workouts seldom last more than 10 minutes. Um, but what I do in those 10 minutes can vary workout to workout. Yeah. This week I did I did interval training, um, essentially circuit training, which is a, you know now it's interesting with high intensity interval training where they're showing short bursts of thirty second all out effort. 
uh, to be equally as beneficial in the realm of cardiovascular efficiency as steady state, lower intensity exercise. Sure. Um, it's interesting. I found that Bruce Lee had purchased in 1972 a Marcy circuit trainer, which is kind of like a universal gym. But the protocol at the time was interval training on it. So you would go stay in the station 30 seconds, as many contractions in a given unit of time as you could perform while still under muscular control. Workout lasted maybe eight minutes. But fast forwarding to present day, now we're seeing more research, particularly out of institutions like McMaster University, saying that high intensity interval training is uh, you know, probably one of the better protocols you can do. And again, it will be for a while. Right, okay. So, sorry, just to clarify then, so um, this high-intensity interval training session you did, what, what is the details of that? Is that? That's not on elliptical or something, it's... Oh, no, no, it's, not, it's all resistance training. Yeah. Okay, okay. But you would set up, I mean, in my gym, it's, it's pretty much all Nautilus machines. So, uh, we use the Nautilus leg press, we use the overhead press, we do bicep curls, calf raises on the multi-X, um, pull downs, tricep press downs. Um, there's about about ten exercises, and then if you're so inclined, you <laughs> at the very end you're you're welcome to to run as fast as you can for about a minute. Um, and I have a fellow that does marathons, and he told me it was like completing the last you know hundred yards of a marathon. When you <laughs> essentially pre-exhaust your legs and then try and run, but they're they're big engines, the legs, and they require a lot of fuel, and that requires a lot of cardiovascular involvement. But uh, you know, having said this, this, I mean that's simply what I'm doing this week. Um, you know, next week it could be Mike Menser's routine, um, and you know, then uh, I've also been going back to well, a couple of weeks ago we did power partials, which is a throwback to power factor training. That was a great protocol too. But at this point in my life, and at my age, and with my, where my priorities are at, that, that that suits me fine as long as my muscles are are, are being. Uh, you know, worked intensely as long as uh, I'm dumping glycogen out of them. Uh, that'll look after some health benefits. And I like I like the what Doug would call global metabolic conditioning of uh, that type of training. Yeah, sure. And that, that's a perfect segue, actually. I wanted to ask you some questions about uh, Mike Mensah. Um, and obviously, we can come back to, to the specifics of working out after that. Um, you you obviously had a very close relationship with Mike Menser, um, and I listened to an interview you did with High Intensity Nation, which was amazing. Um, and you talked about the Golden Triumph. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a Billard Barbell set. Yeah, right, right. Because yeah. you said um, <laughs> book that I have it here somewhere. But. Oh, cool. Yeah, because uh, you said that. I don't know if it was that exact workout, but you said that uh, Mike Mensa. I appreciate that he's a he's a bit of a genetic freak, um, but he was able to gain seventy pound of lean tissue in three years doing a program. Seventy or fifty? I'll have to go back and check it. I actually wrote okay. about that recently. Um, let's see if I can pull it up while we're talking. But yeah, um, it's funny, you know, when we, and especially in high intensity circles. We, we really love uh, to think of ourselves as real innovators. You know, and we're, we're you know, mavericks and firebrands and, and we're brilliant and all of this. And the reality is we're footnotes to DeLorme and Watkins. Uh, these were the first <laughs> physiologists that sort of cracked the nut on progressive resistance. And they essentially laid out the course that's in every barbell set that people buy, which is about three sets of ten. You increase the resistance on each set. A uh, handful of exercises, mainly compound exercises, because they came with your barbell set, and you worked out two to three days a week. But everything else from you know that we do, every other high intensity theorist, myself included, we're footnotes to these people. We didn't, uh, we haven't broken any real new ground. We've 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 had variations on a theme, and in some cases, it's produced very good results. But I haven't seen anyone that has produced exceptional results for protracted periods of time. And by protracted, I mean 10, 20 years. Because I think we run into a genetic ceiling. I think the other factor is we run into that conservation of energy syndrome. And if we're locked into this is the one way, the mechanical approach, if you will, that tends to be where where progress ends. And, you know, in truth, if, since we're being candid, I you know, I have to wonder and I do, <laughs> why, why we continue to be so fascinated with the gorilla suit. 
You know, why, why is it that our existence is defined by how big somebody's arm is? I just, I remember, I remember Mike Menser saying that, you know, were he to do it again, you know, live his life over again, uh, he would have paid way more attention to the uh, psychological development. Not quite so much fanaticism on the bodybuilding component, and he would have adopted what he called a soft core bodybuilding approach. But though, it seems that those that have the gift aren't that enamored with it. And those that don't have the gift, that's all they can think about. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. It's so true. And it's just, it's it's very interesting observation because um, I'm, I'm quite ectomorphic and I'll, I'll put my hand up and admit that uh, I am always looking for ways to, to get the best results and, and get the, you know, increased muscle mass. Um, wrong with that. And, and that's a good thing to do. Um, but I think that you're going to find, because um, you're a young man still, not, a, not an old bugger like me, but <laughs> If, I think what you'll find over time, and as those years of interest that you have turn into decades, that uh, it's a bit of a moving target. It's uh, when we try to crystallize it into this is it. It may well work very well for you for a period of time. The fundamental principles will re- work for you for a lifetime, but I think you're gonna you will find a desire, and it's not just psychological, although that certainly plays a role to stick your toe in other waters occasionally, you know, rather than just confine yourself to one pond. What, what other, what would you mean? Like what other, um, what other waters would you suggest? <laughs> <laughs> well, just within, with under the umbrella of intense briefing and frequent, uh, you know, do things as we suggest in body by science, try negative only training, right. try pre exhaustion training, try, uh, well, Steve Reeves, I worked out with Steve Reeves once. He totally kicked my ass, which was an amazing experience. But his protocol they had me do was was three sets of 20 reps. We did legs together. And he had a universal gym in his garage. And what he did is he moved the seat back. And Steve was, God, I want to think he was 70 at that point. Wow. (laughs) And I was in my 30s. And he said, do you want to work out with me? And I was like, well, yeah, work out with Hercules. Who wouldn't want to do that? You know, so we (laughs) went into his garage. And he said, well, here's my leg program. Uh, Great. So... He sat me down on his universal leg press, and he, he moved the seat back. So my range of motion wasn't uh, wasn't very great. And he said, "Do twenty reps." So I was like, "Well, that's no problem." You know, universal machine, big deal. You know, boom, boom, boom. Did did my twenty reps, and then he got on and he did his twenty reps. And then he moved the seat forward, and he said, "Okay, now I'm going to move. I'm going to increase the weight," which he did. And he said, "Now do twenty reps again." Fine. So I'm doing my reps, and about fifteen, I realized I wasn't getting twenty. So at sixteen, that was the end of the show. Of course. Seven-year-old Steve Reeves gets on, bangs out 20 reps. And then he said, okay, now we're going to reduce the weight to what we used the first time, and you're going to do 20 reps again. I said, okay, so I did that same thing. Rep 16, I was done. I was, my legs felt like someone had you know, stuck an air hose in them because they were pumped, but they were so just so sore, I couldn't do anything. And, of course, he got on and did his 20 reps. But that was enough of a variation in the same protocol. I mean, there's a leg workout that takes you, I don't know, a minute and a half, two minutes to complete. But my legs were killing me for three days afterwards. And it was, you know, a 70 year old kicked my ass in the, in the gym. <laughs> um, so just trying these different things can have a tremendous uh, benefit. And I think broaden your understanding that in some respects, everything works and nothing works. But for it to work, it certainly has to follow valid principles, which I think were laid out quite eloquently by both Arthur Jones and Mike Menser years ago, which is intense, brief, and infrequent. But yeah. under that umbrella, you've got some freedom. You've got a little bit of liberty to try these different things. And don't get too hung up if, uh, um, you know, you don't gain you know massive amounts of muscle. Um, the reality is that very few of us can do that. And when I say us, I don't mean I gain massive muscle, but I mean our population, our species generally. And the people that have large, inordinately large muscles uh, are the freaks of the genetic, you know, genetic freaks of our species. Uh, genetics gets downplayed in our industry, uh, even by personal trainers, because you can't turn a dollar on it. You know, it's, but we've all gone to school with guys who are just big. Probably you're in the UK, you probably went to school with guys who played rugby that were massive. Um, and when you take a guy with naturally big genetics and marry that with resistance training, they're going, he's going to get even bigger. If I have 400,000 fibers in my biceps and you have 800,000, 
and we both increase the size of those fibers, your arm is still going to be much, much bigger than mine, no matter what I do. Um, and I think it's important to keep that in mind because it, it, it'll save you a lot of frustration. I think you have to make your peace with these biological laws and not be disappointed if your if your you know horse and wagon doesn't take you to the moon. It's not designed for that. And we're the way we are for the most part because that has the greatest survival value. Again, if somebody is a, a has massive musculature, that your entire system has to work overdrive overtime to keep that going. I remember walking down a sidewalk in Santa Monica with Nasser Al Sambadi, the bodybuilder, and he had to stop and under a block and catch his breath. Wow. So, you know, on the one hand we all thought, geez, we'd like to have big muscles like that. But again, I don't know that I'd want that big a decrease in functional ability. Just have a tighter shirt. <laughs> well put. Um, yeah, no, that's true. Just, uh, just wanted to interject earlier, but I didn't want to ruin your flow. Um, you mentioned about that work. Slow you on a bald guy. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> you, uh, you mentioned about your workout with Steve Reeves. Um, and I was just wondering, uh, one thing I've noticed is if I go from super slow cadence to yeah. a four, two, four, or yeah, even, or if I just make the slightest change in cadence, I can do the same protocol, but I will feel oh, I'll have a different workout. Yeah, yeah, and that's what we're talking about. It's yeah, it's you know, your body doesn't know what workout you're doing. It, it basically is like it's reading energy output sine waves, and when you do something different, it's like whoa, that's different, and it throws all the troops it's got at its disposal into that uh, to get you out of what it perceives to be uh, an inordinate situation that could be threatening. So, but even even just a slight instead of you know, if you do three sets of ten and you start light and you work heavy, and you simply flip that on its head and start heavy and work light, that represents a significant enough change that it's a different workout um, to your body anyway. So, and, and I guess you know, my thinking presently is that that's not a bad thing. It's okay to experiment and, uh, and not worry that you've deviated from uh, you know, holy writ that has been handed down by high-intensity training theorists. Uh, when you consider the most high intensity training theorists and most personal trainers and, and the entire fitness industry has been founded largely on uh, commercialism, commercial interests, rather than, you know, actual science. Yeah, um, yeah. And especially with regards to issues like recovery, because again, like genetics, it's very difficult to turn a dollar on that. I mean, <laughs> what do you sell? You know, a, a hammock, maybe. Uh, for, <laughs> a hyperbaric chamber. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's, you know, we, we're so obsessed with the stimulus side of the equation, how to make things more intense, that, uh, you, know, any, you know, any variation on that theme we consider to be real progress. But, you know, beyond a certain threshold, amping the intensity is almost like amping the volume. It's going to have a, a negative effect that you simply will, will have no real benefit to you other than protract your, the recovery interval necessary. Mm-hmm. Mike was on to that before he died, and I think, I think that's an interesting area to explore. Uh, I remember seeing studies, i got to remember the physiologist's name was Grillner and Udo, and I think this was probably back in the 60s or 70s, might even have been the 80s, where they saw that there was a tandem increase with fiber recruitment and load, but only up to a point. And that 90% of the fibers you could recruit were recruited with a load at 50% of your one rep max. So, you know, thinking about different ways to, to uh, you know, keep that intensity going and try and, you know, hammer the muscle with, with more load, more reps, forced reps, negative reps, all of these things, to me is a little bit like, you know, you have a fly and you hit it with a newspaper and then you hit it with a two by four and then you, you hit it with a, you know, a bazooka. You, you got it the first time. <laughs> and all this other stuff is simply um, unnecessary at best and could actually be negative at worst. I mean, we're starting to see some data, mainly in, in the ultra-endurance events, which obviously are not quite like what we're doing uh, in the high-intensity world. But we're seeing that the human body has a finite capacity to deal with protracted metabolic, heightened metabolic activity. And I think there are two sides of the same coin. You can go ultra endurance or you can go ultra intense, neither of which is necessarily desirable. And we want that, if you will, at the risk of sounding too simplistic, that Aristotelian middle path, ideally. Yeah, that's a really that's a really good point. Um, just again, I don't mean to keep laboring on this point, but just when you uh, when you do change 
protocols um, mm-hmm. to, to, I guess, get that variation. Would you, I mean, how long would you, because obviously you'd want to still repeat that protocol for a certain amount of time so you can then work out if indeed you are progressing, getting stronger, you're working out how much recovery you need between workouts. So how long do you do the new protocol for on average? You know, I, I don't have it scratch and stone, and I'll preface that by saying that what I do, I, I don't necessarily advocate that for everybody or anybody. Mm-hmm. It's just what I'm doing. And I, again, I've been in this game since I was 16. So I've tried all the various protocols that have come down the pike and I've been uh, loyal and to frequency and to, and to recording data and everything else. And, and at 55, it ceases to be a passion for me to, to do that. So my training presently, well, I want to train efficiently um, and I want to be healthy and I want to increase functional ability and I don't want to pack on a bunch of body fat. It's just what I'm doing. Um, and I, I, I don't possess any special knowledge that will benefit everybody. I think, it, like most people, if you start with your your, your barbell set, and once you've progressed with, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, an introduction to resistance training, and then you want to do um, the body by science protocol or the... Uh, essentially a super slow protocol, that's good as well. But don't get married to it. You know, it's okay to broaden your perspectives on that without any ill consequence. I mean, the world's not going to stop revolving if you do, you know, three sets for your biceps instead of one. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, there's so much hair splitting in this industry, it's silly. But the key is, you know, train hard enough to recruit and stimulate those fibers, however hard that may be for you. If you do that, your workout's not going to be very long. You know, it might be 10 minutes, it might be six minutes, it might be 20 minutes. It's going to depend on the intensity effort you put in. And the other thing is, don't go back and do it again until you have to. It's not about training as often as, as you can within a certain period of time. It's as often as you actually are required to, depending on the recovery of the fibers. And you may find, you know, heresy of heresies, that after four days, you want to work out again. Well, then do it. Um, but keep your progress chart. And if you see that your your numbers are going down, well, then, then don't necessarily engage a whim um, just train when you need to and and you may find you tr- need to train a lot less frequently than you think I don't I don't get hung up anymore if my workout sessions are are spaced out to 10 days or 14 days or whatever uh, I try to do it once every seven days but that's mainly from a health perspective I think there's there's a benefit on issues like insulin sensitivity and things like that if you have a glycogen dump out of the muscles uh, yeah. every seven days especially if you're at all like me and enjoy beer, you know, um, <laughs> that you're, you know, you're going to be pumping the, the glucose to yourself quite quickly, so you better have a, a release valve for some of that. Um, but in Canada, uh, of course, with hockey and everything like that, um, it's almost like the pub scene in the UK. I mean, everybody drinks beer here, or at least any friend of mine does. You know, so uh, you have to make allowances for that. But I mean, in, in your case, if you're looking for a, a specific program, go with the I mean, really, a lot of the the material, I think, the distilled material of our years in this industry are, is, can be found within the pages of that book. Start out with the big five. When that, you're going to find at one point while you're doing the big five that you may be out of gas after three exercises. You're giving 100%, but you no longer have 100% to give. Uh, and that happens when you start to encounter meaningful loads and meaningful effort. Um, and your first three exercises, in which case cut it to a big three. And then, you know, if a workout happens to present itself in which you feel you've got, oh, I didn't really feel like I worked, you know, as hard as I could have, or I've got a little bit extra in the tank. Uh, again, the world's not going to stop revolving if you do another exercise. Yeah. So go by your recovery. We have certain guideposts that can help assist us in the process. We know that it has to be intense. If you're going to be in the gym for an hour and a half, you're not working very intensely. Uh, if you're able to do it again the next day and the day after a game, the type of fibers that you obviously recruited in the prior workout were largely slow-twitch fibers because they recovered quick enough that you could do it again. Uh, but if you're going to train thoroughly, meaning that you want to get slow-twitch, intermediate, and fast-twitch fibers activated with your workout, then you have to recognize that fast twitch fibers do not share the same recovery profile as slow twitch. Mm-hmm. So give them the time they need to be fully recovered and ideally overcompensated and then then hit it again. But I think if you approach it in that manner, you'll do so with a lot less angst, uh, which tends to 
uh, we obsess about this in the high intensity world. You know, yeah. let's, let's, if you miss it by even 10 minutes or one hour or one day, boy, it's all the gains that you could have had are going to elude your grasp. And it, it just doesn't work that way. Yeah. Yeah. No, we're, I, sorry. You know, we're dealing with an organism, not a, it's not mechanics that way. And uh, there's, a, like I say, there's a lot of obsessing about protocol. But, I mean, it's not that dissimilar to, to growing a plant, if you will, another organic process. You need the soil, which I guess you can liken to your genetics. You need uh, the right stimulus, which you can liken to watering the plant. And uh, you need the right environment, um, which would be nutrition or you know, sunlight in the case of a plant. But, uh, you know, we're obsessing about how we're holding the watering can when we're pouring the water, you know, it's got to be in a Zen-like state and you got to do it slowly. So it's not that really what matters is that you get adequate water, you get adequate stimulation and then you let your genetics take it from there just as you would with a plant. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really good advice. Um, just going back to uh, your time with Mike, um, I, I'm interested to ask, did um, I imagine a lot of people went up to Mike and said, Mike, how do I look like you? What would he, what, what would he tell them? Have you, um, I've, heard of, heard, I've heard his answer to that. He said, I'd love to hear it. The yeah. Same parents. Yeah. He basically said, choose the same parents I had. <laughs> really? Because he said his father had 18 and a half inch calves, Harry Menser, and he never once lifted a weight in his life. <laughs> That's brilliant. So he was the first to, he was the first and perhaps the only bodybuilder who, really did a mea culpa on the genetics issue. And Mike was huge. I remember visiting him at his apartment in, oh, it was in the 80s. I think it was 88. And do you remember when swatches were popular? There used to be these plastic Swiss watches. Yes. They were a de rigueur and at a certain point. Well, uh, I had a swatch, and I was quite proud of it. And uh, went to Mike's apartment. I stayed at his apartment one week, and he was going to a business meeting. And as he was coming around, the corner from his kitchen of the living room, he caught the edge of the watch on a table and it snapped the band. And he said, oh, shit, you know, I broke my watch and uh, I got to go to this meeting. And I said, oh, not to worry, I, I have a swatch. And uh, I have, you know, I have small bones in my wrist, so, so uh, there's like an extra, this much of the band, which is about four inches with you know, holes in it. I said, it'll, it'll be fine for you. And he said, it won't fit me. Hmm. You know, I said, well, yeah, okay, Mr. Olympia, you know, uh, of course it'll fit. <laughs> You know, what are you, gorilla? He said, well, I'll prove it to you. Give me the watch. So he, I gave him the watch, and it wouldn't go all the way around his wrist. No. But that's genetics. And you're he, not a small guy, a massive, are you? He had a <laughs> massive... Hmm. Sorry, go What's on. What's that? No, I said, you're not a small guy either, so that's why that surprised me. Uh, well, I'm smaller than Mike was. <laughs> <laughs> Mike was a, I mean, I remember that same visit, talking to him. He was sitting across from me uh, on his couch, and he reached over for something. And his arm just seemed to expand like the hood of a cobra. I'd never seen an arm like that. Uh, but and he wasn't on steroids at that point. That's just that's genetics. And uh, like I say, when you get those kind of genetics married with proper resistance training and intelligent resistance training, not to mention anabolics when he was competing, it's it's freakish the way these people look. Um, yeah. Yeah. But Mike was the first one to, to tell you genetics are the big thing and that his parents are why he was the way he was largely yeah that's a very admirable um you don't have to answer this question but i'm I just really curious what why did 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 mike kind of let himself go as he got older and why did he do that he just didn't seem the same um well no he wasn't the same uh, um mike had gone through i mean it's a fascinating story the mike Menser story and i always liken it to he and arnold because they were antipode but it was a trajectory of two human lives and they intersected at the 80 Olympia. And Arnold went on, of course, to everything he's got on to, and Mike went down. I mean, he went from, he told me that in 1979, he was earning about 300,000 U.S. a year, which is good money even today, wow, yeah. from seminars and touring and mail order and everything, to two years later to zero. Yeah, well, he, I mean, it was ground zero. He was living on the street. He had to sneak into hotels to eat uh, scraps off of room service trays in order to survive. Uh, so he had a, a large fall, mainly because he was blacklisted in bodybuilding. And um, but like I say, it's a fascinating study of two lives. But the one thing that Mike always preserved in all the years that I knew him was his integrity. As Boyer Co. said, he would never lie about anything. 
So I found Mike to be fascinating in that respect. But um, he had uh, some problems. He had some neck problems, back problems from lifting heavy, heavy, heavy weights when he was doing powerlifting and Olympic lifting. And he had some surgery. I believe he had neck surgery. He'd fallen and torn his tricep almost off the bone at one point. And um, so he, he was on blood thinners for a heart condition. So yeah, he was not uh, he was not able to train. I don't think Mike. Last time I saw Mike working out was in the late '90s, and he was dead in 2001. So uh, yeah, he, he I mean he spent a period of time in the hospital just because he was he he was not well. So he didn't train. His muscles atrophied, and uh, he wasn't in good shape at the end of his life. But I think had we were lucky, given his genetic predisposition to heart disease. We were lucky to have had him as long as we did. And when he was strength training, he was in tremendous shape and there was no problems. I think it was when the health ailments set in that, and he stopped being able to work out that the problems began. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, and I think it's... Um it's it's incredibly sad to hear that um, the the corrupt health and fitness industry was um, sort of part to blame from what it sounds like for his part of his downfall. Um, yeah, because yeah, he's an incredible um, you know sort of pioneer in in exercise and philosophy in general. Um, yeah, the world would have the bodybuilding world certainly would have changed had he won the Mister Olympia title because then that high intensity approach would have been um, accepted across the board or at least been advanced further than it, it was as a result of his loss of that contest. But, you know, it, it is what it is. He was, uh, Mike was a great guy, hilarious uh, company, very witty, as most people who are, uh, you know, have a broad reference or knowledge base tend to be. Mm. Uh, and he was very uh, compassionate. He was very helpful to people. Uh, my strongest memory now of Mike was when I went to visit him shortly before his death at the uh, veterans hospital in Santa Monica and I w- it was one of those things where I knew Mike was in rough shape physically obviously and that that uh, it, since he the magazines weren't uh, you know going out of their way to help him he basically didn't have much money and that was my prompt at the time to say well Mike why don't you do a book that would go into bookstores I said right now you're heavy duty books someone has to buy a muscle magazine and then they have to go through it and happen upon your ad. And then if they're so motivated, write a check, go to the post office. I said, if you had a book on, like in every bookstore and library, it would be a good lightning rod to alert people to your legacy, your research, what you've done. And that was the genesis for uh, high intensity training, the Mike Manser way, that book. That's a great but, book. Uh, but uh, while we was there, I mean, you've got to remember, this is a man who's, you know, just come out of the hospital, literally, we we're outside, he was in a wheelchair, and um, no money, so that's, you know, to you and I, that would be the most important thing, so if someone comes to you and says, I think I can get a book deal, you would be all ears, because that's vital. Instead, Mike turned his attention to um, a veteran, I remember it was, it was a guy that was holding his jaw, it was a black guy, not that that matters, but he was, uh, he was a, uh, obviously, being at that hospital, he was he was a, he was a vet, and uh, Mike suddenly cut off our conversation, went over to this guy, and said, "You know what's what's wrong?" And the guy told him some sort of medication he was on, and Mike had an encyclopedic knowledge of pharmacology and physiology, and he said, "Oh no, here's what you want to do," and blah blah blah, and talked to this guy about that, and he spent an hour with this guy, who offered him nothing. I mean, there's nothing that was going to better Mike's station in life by talking to this guy, but he felt. The, again, there was a human being that, that needed some advice that Mike had that he felt might be of, of help, and that's what he, what he did. And that was the kind of guy he was. So that always resonated with me. That's awesome. Um, okay, cool. No, that's, that's great. Thank you for contributing that. Um, just shifting gears into the controversial field of nutrition, um, really interested to get your take on this. Um, again, this is the difficult question to ask because it is it, such a difficult one to answer uh, i'm sure but what, what is there is there in your view an optimal kind of macro micro nutrient diet for i guess optimal results when it comes to high intensity training uh, the short answer is no in my opinion again i mean you have to remember that most of my 
education on nutrition comes from Mike. He was a mentor. And the books that I read, uh, like by Ronald Deutsch, The Realities of Nutrition, were, were textbooks by nutritional scientists. And that shaped my worldview. Now, I admit I, I possess the farthest thing from exhaustive knowledge on this subject. But again, I always, I always try to look at it in a big picture scenario. And that is that um, you know, human beings survive by being able to find what they could depending on the season and, and being able to, their bodies being able to turn whatever they found into essentially whatever they needed. We're omnivores, which is why we have different teeth from canines to incisors and grinding uh, things. And so consequently, we need or can consume a balanced diet. You know, was, uh, the best advice I ever heard about nutrition, again, was spoken by Mike, and he put it in a sentence. And he said, eat a little bit of everything and not too much of anything. And, you know, your, your nutritional needs will be looked after. A well-balanced diet, although it's fallen from favor in some camps, is basically the consumption of foodstuffs that provide all the vitamins, minerals uh, that you require and macronutrients for all of your cells and body to operate optimally. Mm-hmm. And it's pretty hard to go better than that. I think, unfortunately, many of us are looking for super diets and super, that will cause super health, and that just doesn't happen. I mean... Uh, uh, paleo people die at the same rate that uh, you know, China study people uh, die at. Um, low carbohydrates, yeah, or high low carbohydrates, can have, certainly have a better bearing on on insulin. But that's just common sense. I mean, if you're if you're pouring back table sugar, uh, you're probably going to have some insulin issues, uh, and the cells are going to lose their sensitivity. They're going to get inflamed. The body's going to mortar th- that inflammation with cholesterol. Your cholesterol levels will go up. Your blood pressure goes up, et cetera, et cetera. But it's a bit of an extreme. I mean, my reality check on that is Auschwitz. If I went to that prisoner of war and I offered these guys a Snickers bar a day, they're not going to balloon into obese individuals because it all becomes glucose when it hits the bloodstream anyway. And so you can eat not the best diet in the world and your body can still produce what it needs to to keep you alive and keep you healthy. But that doesn't mean that if you just eat nothing but crap, that your body's going to operate optimally and be healthy either. Mm-hmm. But I, I, you know, to me, if you're eating a well-balanced diet, you've covered your nutritional bases. And if, you're, if you want to lose body fat, well, then it's going to come down to portion size. Uh, you're over-consuming. The energy input into the system is, is greater than is required, and you just need to bring that more in line. Um, but I've seen nothing, and I, I've tried to look into it uh, objectively, but I've seen nothing that tells me that this is, you know, the holy grail, that you got to remove all carbohydrates, you, you got to remove all saturated fats or, or proteins, depending on which camp you're into. So I still like Mike's advice. Eat a little bit of everything, not too much of anything. Okay. But what about when it comes to actually um, increasing muscle size and, you know, in, in body by science, for example? But nobody's cracked the nut on that. When it comes to increasing muscle size, name me a diet that is guaranteed to put, put on 30 pounds of muscle on you just through diet. I can't think of any. <laughs> You've got to stimulate the muscle to grow. You've got to create a need for this new tissue to be synthesized by the body. And once that need has been put into motion, your body will produce that tissue and it will produce it out of pretty much whatever you consume if the need for it is strong enough. But as far as putting, you know, guaranteed, you got to remember one big aspect there, and this harkens back to the commercial component, is that we all have it in our heads or most of us do, that muscle equals protein. So, you know, the protein and the type of protein and how the body assimilates that protein, that's a big area of, it, of uh, importance. But muscle is only 26% protein. It's over 76% water. So why aren't we obsessing about the water that we're consuming? Because that is by far the biggest constituent of muscle tissue. And um, I think where some people get a little bit off track in bodybuilding or people who seek to build muscle and here I'm I'm veering off into a bit of conjecture here but is that if the volume of a muscle is largely water 76 percent and the elements that help muscles retain water such as glycogen which bonds to water water bonds to glycogen at three grams per gram so if you flush some glycogen out of the muscle the body tends to put back what was used up and then a little bit extra which means now the volume of your muscle is a little bigger because you put back more glycogen which in turn has caused more water to bond to it so your 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 mass if you will is increased that's one aspect of muscle size and that's an important one 
The other one is hypertrophy or the actual enlargement of the tissue component of muscle. And that only really happens if it's been um, the tension in a muscle is such or the micro trauma is such that it has to repair itself. And so the fiber gets a little bit thicker. But the, by far the greatest uh, you know, mass component of a muscle is water, which is why you see guys injecting synthol with massive arms. It has nothing to do with building the actual fibers, but it does cause the muscle to retain more water and hence a bigger muscle. So I guess it depends on what somebody is looking for. If you're looking to actually increase hypertrophy of individual fibers, then A, you better do some damage to warrant an adaptive response. And then the body needs adequate protein uh, to, to accomplish that objective. But it doesn't need excessive amounts of protein. In fact, excessive amounts of protein will either be excreted or turned to fat uh, because they contain calories just like any other macronutrient. It's, it's not unlike if you're building a chimney and your requirement is 5,000 bricks, but I dump off 7,000 bricks on your site. Well, you still only need 5,000 bricks, and the rest have to be dealt with. And that's the situation the body is in with excess macronutrient consumption. That's a great analogy. Yeah. Um, but I'm just, I don't really want to elaborate because you said you mentioned there's no need for excessive uh, calories um, and, and use that great analogy there. So, you know, but, but surely if you are, if you're looking at, I mean, do you believe in maintenance calories and that you need one to 200 um, surplus to, to then ideally, you know, create the best environment for muscle growth? I'll be honest and just say that's never been an area that has interested me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've always operated on that if I trained hard enough to warrant an adaptive response, my body would produce it. Theoretically, I can I concede your point that if you create an optimal environment, then the results that you have might have stimulated should be optimized. However, beyond that, I mean, it's conjecture. I, I don't know anyone that uh, has continued to build, for example, our discussion about muscle tissue, you know, inordinate amounts that just keep building and building and building because they've you know, they, they tweak the metabolic environment as a result of their nutritional intake. Um, I've just known too many people, including bodybuilders, who don't follow that, and they've had tremendous success, and too many to be anomalies. Yeah. So if, it, if that was an absolutely synchronon of, of muscular success, we wouldn't have these guys, because they didn't do that. Or they, they I mean, Steve Reeves is a great example. He didn't, uh, where, was, where were the supplements on the South Beach diets and all that when he was competing? Um, and yet he seemed to seem to build uh, muscle quite well. Uh, so did all of his competitors for that that uh, matter. Mike Menser was renowned for uh, well, his competitors were eating you know tuna fish and water prior to the contest. He was having ice cream cones and carrot cake and ice cream. Um, he, and he built ten muscle ten pounds of muscle prior to the last Olympia. Granted, they all had anabolics working for them at that point, which could completely level that particular playing field. But, I mean, again, that anabolics, if you will, will certainly optimize the growth process or the requirements, if you will, for producing muscle. And whatever he was consuming, the body seemed to be able to make use of to produce that muscle. Okay. And it wasn't anything okay. special. So, so just prior to, obviously, Mike doing anabolics, and I know he was in um, great shape before that and, and showed amazing potential to grow muscle. Um, so are you telling me that he would have three square meals a day of no... Um, excessive yeah. proportion? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, <laughs> of the times that I ate with Mike, uh, we, I remember a lunch we had and it was just what you might order off a menu. I think it was like a, might have been a steak, uh, mashed potatoes, and we both, and coffee, Mike was a big coffee guy, and, and uh, apple pie with ice cream afterwards. <laughs> Not necessarily a bodybuilder's diet. You know, when, when I was visiting Mike in the 90s at his apartment, we would get uh, pizza and Grolsch beer. That was the first time I saw that top, you know, that you flip off on the Grolsch beer. And that was, Mike enjoyed that. So, no, I mean, Mike was living proof. His detractors would say, yeah, but look at his physique at the end. But I would submit that his physique all throughout his life was a result of that. Uh, uh, and I remember when he was competing in the Superstars competition, which was where they took athletes from various sports and, and placed them into different sports. Uh, Mike did very well in that, and he wanted to lose muscle mass because one of the events he was in was swimming, and he knew that that would he'd sink like a stone with all that muscle mass. So he 
he was doing uh, sprint work because that was one of the events. He was doing swimming. And I think there was a, a like a clean and jerk competition. But he was not on steroids at all. And his body would not give up the muscle that he had built. He went in there weighing about 219. Um, and, I mean, no steroids, huge muscles. But and he, that, that's did he the, reduce his diet as well and still kept the Yeah, body. he wanted to lose weight, but he just the body wasn't giving it up. I don't know how severely he reduced his diet, but, uh, I mean, he was savvy enough in that uh, field to know about you know, reducing his calories and things like that. One thing he was not a proponent of was a high protein diet. He he just saw that as as uh, commercial marketing, in, in, you know, in the purest form. That's all it was. You know, you can't bought the bodybuilding magazines can't sell you water through the mail, but they could sell you protein. And um, and like I say, you know, their argument was muscles made of protein. So you know, the better, more protein you have, more muscle you're going to build. But what they neglected to mention was that seventy six percent of muscle is water. And you don't build bigger muscles by drinking gallons of water every day, even though that is by far the largest constituent of muscle tissue. Mm. Yeah, no, that's a that is a really good point, and it's good to good to hammer that home uh, how important hydration is. Um, okay, fine. So I just wanted to move on to recovery. Um, I had some questions following that really good interview you did with High Intensity Nation. Um, when, it, when you're looking at, let's say you're doing a workout protocol um, and you're looking to see if you're getting enough recovery between workouts, should you be improving across the board? So should all of your exercises be improving, say, time under load? Or is it good enough to say, oh, actually, no, I improved really well on the first one. Um, and then obviously systemic fatigue caused me to, to do the same as or worse than before on the, on the rest. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, usually if I start to see that occurring in, a, in my workout or in one of my client's workouts, then it's those other exercises are, have become extraneous, that you're hitting what you need to hit with your previous exercises. So as a result, by the time you get to, let's say, your fourth exercise or your fifth exercise, you just don't have the gas in the tank to do it justice. So at that point, I mean, you could, you could either rotate those exercises so you're, if you like them, and you want to continue to do them, or just simply, you know, parse them, tweeze them out of the uh, of your routine. It's not necessary to do high volume of exercises. There was an interesting study done uh, not that long ago where they they looked at the role, uh, what role doing supplemental or direct arm work would have on building arm size if you were already doing, say, a, a pull down exercise in your routine. Mm-hmm. And so they had one group that did, you know, a pull down as part of their workout, and another group that did the pull-down plus bicep work. And they found there was no difference at the end of the study. So it, it would seem that if you are activating the bicep muscle and recruiting and stimulating those fibers with an exercise such as a pull-down, it's unnecessary to do supplemental work to hit the biceps again. You know, it goes back to the uh, uh, simile I used about hitting a fly with a you know, with a newspaper and a shoe and a bazooka. You got it the first time. Yeah, okay, fine. So I'm just trying to figure that out in my head. So because at the moment, I'm actually, I've actually gone back to doing Big Five once a week. Um, I was actually doing... How did you find uh, your um, endurance and performance on the Big Five? Is it going up with every workout or do you notice well, that the first three go up and the last two... Well, I, I've actually, I mean, I did, I, I, I obviously I read Body by Science years ago um, and I, 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 you know, I did the big five probably a year ago for eight months or something. And then I broke it down to, um, cause I, sorry, I plateaued. I got, I got stronger. Don't get me wrong. My, uh, my time under load was, is, incre- is so much better than when I started. I mean, the, my strength yeah. is like a hundred percent better, you know, um, Excellent. Although my muscular size increased, it was very it, it was it, it was not in proportion to the uh, the strength gains. <laughs> um, right. So so then what I did so it's so important for me to kind of give you some context. Um, then what I did is I split did a two way split. Um, but then I found that I very quickly plateaued on that, so I went to a three way split. Um, and then I, I again, this could be completely placebo, but I I. I ate less, and I know that we've just talked about how that might not matter that much. And I found that I actually lost weight, and I felt like I lost muscle. So I got a little bit like, ah, what's going on? You know, I've done a freeway split so that I can um, continue to progress, but I feel like I'm, 
I'm losing muscle mass here. And I don't know whether that's because I, I didn't like extending my workouts beyond seven days and maybe I should have and maybe I need more recovery between workouts. Um, so I've kind of come full circle. I've now, I mean, since, since I finished doing a freeway split, I then kind of went back into doing the, um, I did, I did some experiments with the Tim Ferriss four hour body experiment, which I threw in there. Uh, and now I've come back to doing big five again and just seeing where I'm, where I'm at in terms of my, my strength and recovery. So it's just sort of experimenting again, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, no, well, I mean, what you've just described, I think happens to everybody and happens to, happens to all of us. And, uh, I do think part of that is that conservation of energy syndrome, which I refer to, which is just your body, you're, you're working out, but you're probably not using the same volume of muscle fibers and you can't I mean, stimulate into growth fibers that are not involved. Um, and therefore almost intuitively, it would seem you've, you've changed your program a little bit to try and get that machinery engaged again. Sure. Uh, when you, and you know, and that's absolutely fine, and as it should be, uh, fasting if, or dieting, if you will, can can be problematic in gaining muscle, uh, especially if your your carbohydrate intake is low, mm. because when you when you drop your carbs, your body's not going to go without without sugar or glucose, and um, if you don't provide it, the body will go to uh, an amino acid in your muscle called alanine and break it down and convert it into glucose to send it back up uh, to be utilized. So you can catabolize muscle tissue when you're working out, or sorry, when you're dieting, if you're dieting too, you know, too severely. I don't know if that was the case with you or not, but it is a, a caveat that needs to be weighed in when you're you know, trying to optimize, as you mentioned, the anabolic environment uh, naturally in the body. Yeah. But... Uh, yeah, and I, I mean, try. I mean, I, I, I'm, my advice. I mean, you're probably as conversant in high intensity theory as as I am at this point. But uh, my only counsel would be, don't uh, be a slave to to a protocol. You know, um, just you know, try something different. Try one of the best results I ever got in my life was doing heavy overload partial reps. My body really responded quickly to that. But I also know that I, I wasn't paying attention to frequency back then. I, we, were, we were training, I think, three days a week. And I knew theoretically that outputting a greater amount of energy, which is required when you're lifting heavier weights for a lot of repetitions, uh, necessitated a longer recovery interval because, it, you know, if you, if you empty your tank, it takes longer to fill it up than if you only, you know, take a quarter of it tank uh, of gas so uh, but I so after about six months of that I uh, I hit a wall by training three days a week but the heavy overload partials uh, were effective for me and I think it was mainly because fiber recruitment is dictated primarily by load um, if I give you a pencil only the amount of fibers required to lift that tencil, pencil come into play if I give you a transmission everything comes into play um, so the question then becomes what can you contract against? Not what can you lift through an exaggerated range of motion, but what can you contract against? And what you'll find is that you can contract against a tremendous amount of resistance uh, if you remove the impediment of the weak link, the weak point in the range of motion, which usually is the, the stumbling block for most people. If you're doing a barbell bench press, for example, failure always occurs uh, about two or three inches off the chest. It never occurs two inches from the top. Um, and that's because that's where you're strongest. That's where your optimal leverage of muscular configuration is for producing strength. Uh, having said that, um, that was a protocol that I found very effective. It may, it may prove to be an effective one for you. And then again, maybe what you're doing is going to be perfect for you. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I've, uh, no, that's really good advice. I appreciate that. I've, um, advice, incidentally. <laughs> When I hear myself giving advice, I'm reminded of this, and that is Voltaire's quote, or the quote attributed to him, which is, cherish those that seek the truth, but beware of those that find it, because they're usually selling you something. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good advice. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've certainly, I mean, I'm recently putting together a, a, an ebook of transcriptions, which is transcriptions from all of the interviews I've done and I've recently just reread two two of the the ones I did with Doug and um I just learned so much reading that that interview um yeah. particular well, Doug in my yeah and Doug in my estimation is the brightest mind in exercise today bar none um 
it's funny how we met, uh, not to be tangential, but uh, right. after Mike had died, um, Joanne Sharkey, who was Mike's business manager, uh, I was writing a column uh, of heavy duty for Iron Man magazine. And I write the column in exchange for an ad, which I gave to Joanne so that Mike's teachings could continue to get out there. And uh, we would, and during our correspondence, she indicated that she had some of Mike's uh, effects, uh, personal effects, and, and would I be interested in looking through them to can help with the topics for writing. And one of the things she mentioned was a videotape by a Dr. Doug McGuff on high-intensity training. She said, would you like to see it? And I said, no, because the last thing this world needs is another medical doctor who thinks he's a you know, brilliant exercise person, and all he's going to do is parrot Mike Menser, so I have no interest whatsoever. But then I got thinking about it. I thought, well, you know what? I may be asked a question about this guy, and if I don't know anything about him, and I'm trying to represent Mike's thoughts on this, um, that wouldn't be right. So, yeah, send me the tape. So she sent me this video of Doug doing a seminar, and I put it on my shelf where it remained for over a year. And then one day I had nothing to do. I thought, well, I better get this over with. Put it in and played it. And within five minutes I was like, oh, my God, this guy knows whereof he speaks. And he was saying stuff that I had never heard before. And I thought, this is a guy I can learn from. And I contacted him. He was at his house. I remember he had his cell phone, and he was in his backyard because they were working on his kitchen. And I wanted to ask him a question that I get asked all the time at our facility by people who are unfamiliar or not conversant with high-intensity training, and that is, how do you get an aerobic benefit out of an anaerobic activity? And I, typically, I just go to studies and say, well, there, prove that there was a cardiovascular benefit, and that's it. You know, And it's an independently done study, so that should satisfy your curiosity. But I thought, well, Doug might have the more simplistic answer, so I'm going to, I'll ask Doug this question. And Doug said, oh, that, yeah, no problem. <laughs> Off he went for about 20 minutes on a dissertation on uh, organic chemistry and pyruvate, and I had no idea what he, what he was saying to me. It was like he'd suddenly started speaking Latin, and that's when I realized, man, I am, uh, whatever I think I know, I'm ignorant, you know, and I've got to, I'm going to call him back, which I did, record what he said, transcribe what he said. And then, you know, check it in medical dictionaries and, and physiology textbooks. And he was, as always, right on the money. And uh, he's a, a very intellectually honest man. He's, as I say, the brightest mind, I believe, in exercise science today. And uh, in no way a, uh, a, a guy who's looking for a, for a fiefdom. He's, he's uh, very objective, very independently minded, and... Uh, uh, any advice Doug gives is, is worthy of consideration. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, it was an honor when I got him on. He was the first guest I had as well, um, which just shows you the kind of guy he is because, you know, I was largely unknown. Not Well, you know, we're still working on that. Um, but, 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 but the website was very new um, and I just contacted him out of the blue just because after reading Body by Science, um, yeah. I was so curious and wanted to ask him more questions. And yeah, I mean, he's such a, a like you say, just honest. He's not... You know, I, I remember a talk he did about, I think it's called Health, Fitness and Liberty. And at the end of it, he managed, it, sorry, he mentioned that um, the essence of capitalism is kindness. And that really resonated with me. And, and, and you're, still, you're the same, you know, I just heard an interview, well, this is that interview on High Intensity Nation. You just, you said at the end, um, no, I don't have anything I want to say. I don't have any goods or services I want to promote. Um, I don't want to sell anything. And I just, I just think that's, as soon as I hear that, it's like, okay, these are the guys I want to actually follow and read their stuff because they're genuine and they're objective and I can really learn, learn from them. Because there is a lot of distraction out there. Oh, um, for sure. And it, it's difficult to separate the wheat from the chaff. So, um, yeah. That's you need to, at least in my case, I've always been an inveterate hero worshiper and, and uh, Mike Menser was, was a big factor for me. And with Mike's passing, a lot of my, you know, the, the source of my flame uh, was extinguished to a large extent. And I see a lot of people trying to, you know, come in and affect a Mensurian uh, approach to the, you know, beating their own drum. But he was unique. And, uh, and I really, really uh, find myself missing Mike quite a bit. Even certain other projects I've done that were not related to high intensity training. Um, I was fortunate to do um, two films, one on Leonard Peacock, who was Ayn Rand's right-hand man, 
and also on Ayn Rand. I worked with her estate um, on a film. And we had access to over 40 hours of never before heard audio. And I thought, oh, Mike would love this. But unfortunately, he wasn't around for me to share that with. But uh, yeah, at any time I have a slight, you know, what I think, uh, you know, eureka moment and looking at, at uh, training and exercise, I always, you know, I miss not being able to pick up a phone and run that by him because uh, Mike, Mike was very candid. <laughs> and uh, would, but in a kind way. But he would, uh, he would, you know, gently remind you of principles which were immutable. And if your theory fell outside of that, then it was time to go back and re-examine the theory again. And uh, I really, really uh, miss that sounding board uh, from Mike. Uh, but like I say, in lieu of Mike Menser not being on the scene, you can't go wrong with Doug McGuff. Yeah, yeah, no, and I, I appreciate that, and I can imagine that is hard for you. And um, I, yeah, like from what you said, what, I mean, I've read, I read uh, the Mike Mensa away, and um, what I learned about him, it, it doesn't seem like there's anyone else. <laughs> sorry, there's very few people like him. Um, so yeah. it must be difficult to find an equivalent or someone who I don't know other people in your life who um, are as inspiring and and who you can learn from like him. Yeah, no, I haven't found anyone to take Mike's place for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, like I said, we're all footnotes anyway to that. I mean, <laughs> most most of us got into. Uh, I mean, and that's why it's important not to take yourself too seriously in this business. You know, we're a moment in geological time, and uh, there are some people that make significant contributions. The ones that actually broke open the trail, Arthur Jones certainly did that. Although he was never a direct influence on me, and Mike Menser, who was the one who took his message and refined it and brought it out to the masses to, in, in, a, in, a, in a manner that made us listen, I think, because of Mike's genetics and his physique. Arthur Jones, I mean, great as he was, I mean, he didn't, he never struck me as a guy that, oh boy, I want to look like Arthur Jones. You know, it was uh, Mike Menser, on the other hand, had, you know, had it all. He was a good looking guy, a tremendous physique, he had a, yeah. he had a, a brilliant yeah. intellect and conversation, great sense of humor. Um, so when Mike spoke, we tended to listen. Um, and it was only afterwards that we, you know, for people that were really, really zealots, uh, we'd go back and read what Arthur Jones had to say, but I, I still prefer to, you know, it didn't really matter what, what bottle the medicine was in. It was important that you took the medicine, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, just want to go back to just quickly go back to some, uh, some questions around workouts. Um, you mentioned, in fact, you may have already answered this in part already, but um, in, in an interview you did on the, the High Intensity Nation interview, you said that there is a there is training, um, one can train too intensely. Um, what does that mean, and how do you know if you have trained too intensely? Well, I think the, the way you know you've trained too intensely, you can probably take that in small doses. I mean, I'm sure you can train as intensely as you, you want to. But I think a steady diet of that, you, you end up getting weaker. You, the, the classic overtraining syndromes, uh, symptoms begin to appear. Lethargy, uh, more susceptible to colds and viruses, uh, a dragginess. You're, an inclination to really engage in an all-out effort is gone, all of these things. But, I mean, you can liken it. With, the high-intensity world always likes the suntan analogy, which I'm sure you've heard a thousand times. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's like getting a suntan. And, but in this respect, it's valid in that, you know, if, you, if you're out there for just, just what's required, you're, the, then the stimulus from the UV radiation will prompt your body to produce more melanin and a greater tan. But if you just go out there and say, well, sun is the cause of, of a tan, so I'm going to stay out here all day long, uh, all you're going to get is burns, blisters, and tissue breakdown. Mm -hmm. And I think the same is true with, with intense exercise. There's, taking the right amount is, is good. Um, but taking more than is required is is not only not desirable. I think it's it's a step toward uh, you know, well, it's a step in the wrong direction. It could even be dangerous. Doug in his first book actually had a good statement about uh, that attitude with regard to um, analgesics. He said, you know, you take you know two Tylenol for a headache, and you think, okay, well, if I take six of them, it'll get rid of it six times quicker. Well, it, it doesn't produce more of the beneficial effect. What it does is burn a hole in your stomach lining. And I think if you do too much or too intense an exercise, you set up a situation where it's almost impossible to recover. Uh, I remember a study, and I think I quoted it in uh, Max Contraction and even in Power Factor Training, about uh, people that did negative-only bicep work. And they found that 12 weeks later, they still hadn't recovered 
the strength they had prior to that workout. So that's three months. Wow. You know, that's, uh, and so we don't know how long is actually optimal between workouts uh, to take. Nobody knows that. But it's probably a lot longer than we think. And all of us have been conditioned to think that we have to do our workouts within a a seven-day span and perhaps more frequently than that. Mm -hmm. But no one's been yet has been willing to really test that, you know, to take a year off and and uh, maybe work out once a month and see, see what the results are. You know, are you going to lose muscle? Are you going to gain muscle? Are your gains going to be the same? Well, if they're the same, then why, why train more often? Because that's simply more wear and tear. Yeah. And wear, wear and tear is an issue that has come into my radar recently. And that is, you know, the, the hinge joints in your knees and your elbows aren't really that dissimilar than the hinge joints in your door. And you've got a lifetime of opening and closings of that door before you wear out the hinges. If you take, for example, a form of exercise that is of a lower intensity, longer duration, let's say cycling, it wouldn't be unusual to open and close the hinge joints in your knee over 10,000 times during a cycle. Yeah. Well, that's opening and closing its hinges on your door 10,000 times. Now, if you do that three or four days a week, that's 10,000 times over and above the normal use that those hinge joints are going to get. And that's a fast track to arthritis because you're just going to wear out the hinges quicker. I think one of the big advantages of resistance training and particularly resistance training the way that we advocate, is that the benefit you get from what otherwise would have required many thousands of opening and closings of those hinge joints, i.e. the penetration and stimulation of, of the bulk of the muscle, you can now do in about four or five reps, or in the case of a motionless protocol, no reps. Mm-hmm. It seems to be load and time are the big factors on fiber recruitment and stimulation. So if you can avoid or diminish some of the negative components typically associated with exercise, then I think you may have evolved this a step or so. Um, but uh, wear and tear is a big one for me, and that's why like protocols such as done in one, I think, in my opinion, uh, get a little bit closer to you know sort of moving that needle over closer to the ideal. Um, even a, a five rep protocol such as super slow, which is tremendous compared to some of the other you know, 20 rep sets and things like that is still five times more reps than you would do with a done in one, for example. Um, and I'm not holding done in one up or any of any of the protocols that I've uh, used or created as being superior to any other one. But uh, I think in terms of, of diminishing some of the negative elements of exercise, they're at least a, a step in the right direction. Mm-hmm. No, that's good stuff. Um, just want to be respectful of your time, John. Um, and I've got some questions I kind of want to ask, like rapid fire, if you will. Sure. Um, Difficult one. I don't think the synapses of my brain are rapid fire, but I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they, don't worry. The answers don't have to be rapid fire, just the questions. Um, okay. Be, best piece of advice you've ever received? Would have been from Mike Menser. And uh, it would have been the, the, the basically the encapsulation of high intensity training uh, philosophy, which is uh, train, train intense, brief, and infrequent. As he said, you know, a lot of people like to. Uh, talk about the science of bodybuilding, but he said when you remove all the academic bullshit from it, it just you get your ass into the gym and you train hard. And if you train hard, you're not going to train long. So you know, just like you know, the faster you run, the less distance you can run. So, but go in there, train hard. You know, try and stimulate as much fiber as you can, then get out of the gym and don't think about it. Just go home, rest, and grow, and don't train again until you're really ready to train again. Which, according to you know, any research I've done or looked into is usually about seven days. Yeah, cool. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. Top three high intensity training tips, but you can't say brief, infrequent, intense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, you know, I got to say, as a side note, I don't even like the term hit. Oh, really? Uh, I just, oh, would you prefer? So over you. I, I don't know. I don't know that I have a preference, to be honest. It's just, it sounds like a club and I'm, uh, I'm not a joiner of any type of club, you know, Oh, you do hit, you know, someone says that to me. It's like, Oh, please. You know. Do you know what? Um, I, I agree with you. I am. Um, Cause I heard, I heard, uh, I've interviewed James Steele and James Fisher, who I don't know if you're aware of those guys. They're, they're, yeah. they're you aware of those guys? Yeah, absolutely. I've read, I think was it was, uh, Fisher's the one who's done a lot of the, uh, uh Peer-reviewed uh, papers that have been published. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I like their work actually. Yeah, so no, I've had them both on. They're great. Um, and I, I think it was um, 
uh, one of the studies James did, which was titled Evidence-Based Exercise and or evidence-based oh. resistance training. And I, and I thought, oh, that sounds way better than high-intensity training. So I, I, almost, I, I almost thought about, oh, maybe I should rebrand. And, and you know, you have these, these moments where I'm like, oh, my God, I have to change everything on the website in order to be congruent with this <laughs> message. And then I'm just like, oh, st- i got to stop caring about that, that vanity so much. And, but I agree with you. Like, HIT is, um, I guess, almost cliche. Uh, and It is, and it's... Yeah, I don't know. I just it's it's one of these things. I've never been a joiner. I don't uh, I don't like being into a group because usually when you when you join something, you're instructed as to how to behave and how to think, and I think that completely kills the scientific spirit. Uh, Absolutely. You know, if Absolutely. if what I do falls under the umbrella of what is called high intensity training, that's fine. But I could care less. You know. Okay. I'll tell you what. Let's rephrase that then. So I'd say top three health and fitness tips then in that case hmm. <clears throat> I'm hearing Mike Menser's voice about the word three again uh, coming in <laughs> um, well and I can't use intense brief and frequent okay <laughs> then I would say uh, uh, high energy output activity uh, we instinctively hate to do it our bodies hate to do it but it is the uh, the very tonic that we require from an exercise perspective, and that is try and be as thorough as possible in uh, fiber stimulation, not just slow twitch or intermediate twitch. Try and get them all, and if you do that, uh, it really doesn't matter what route you take, but do be cautious if you have a choice on wear and tear and force issues because you want to be in this for the long haul. You don't want to be arthritic by the time you're 50. You want to be healthy and fit and have the best possible functional ability that you can have as you head into your autumn years. Exercise is a, it's not pleasant, but it's, it's absolutely vital to uh, our ability to function as we get older. We're seeing now that strength training, once regarded as the weak sister in exercise to aerobic training, is in fact, uh, you know, the Rosetta Stone. It's, if you don't have strength, you have nothing. And even your, even the mitochondria, which you, uh, for aerobic development, reside most predominantly in muscle tissue. So uh, be thorough in your training. Don't shy away from high energy output activity. In fact, learn to embrace it. Get comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's simply your physiology speaking to you. Uh, the burn that you experience, uh, and many people don't like, is not an evil humor to be avoided. It's it's the synchronon of successful training. You've got to have that. And the other thing is don't beat yourself up if you don't make it into the gym over a one or two week period. You're not going to lose anything. Uh, in fact, you may actually gain something. Um, most people that are adamant and regimented, you got to be in there twice a week or in some cases once a week, they're not really aware that the dynamics of the human body varies across a very broad continuum. You may have outside demands. You didn't get much sleep. You're having financial problems. You broke up with your wife, your girlfriend. A child could be sick. All of these compete for recovery resources. And, you know, trying to put another inch on your arms in that context is misplaced enthusiasm. Um, You know, there's a big world out there of which training should be an adjunct, not the reason for it. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. I think that's, do you know what, John? I think those are that's some of the best set of tips we've had um, on Corporate Warrior. So that was awesome. Um, okay. Just get out more, Lawrence. Yeah. I just got to get out more. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fair play. Um, okay. Fair, uh, top recommendations for books um, for people who want to kind of, um, you know, uh, what, what books should people be focused on? What are, the, in your opinion, the top books in this field? It's a pretty small list, really. Uh, Great. I would say Body by Science, not because of my involvement with it, but because of Doug's. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think Doug's contribution in that, particularly the chapter on global metabolic conditioning, is absolutely mandatory reading for people. Uh, I think you could just have that book and and not go too far wrong. I would also put uh, the last book I, I did with Mike, again, not for any contribution from me, but from from that's Mike's contribution, uh, high intensity training the Mike Menser way. I think is is a good book. Uh, I'm trying to think of other books. I mean, I've, I've read other books that I think express the same principles uh, in a, in a good way. Fred Hahn's book's very good. Slow Burn is a good book and a good read. Um, and basically, 
encapsulates many of the same principles. Uh, uh, who else? Who else's books would I recommend? Certain, if you, I mean, if you're, that covers really what I think the fundamentals of what you need to know. Unless you have a specific desire, you want to be a power lifter or whatever it is, then there's probably other books that speak to that specifically. Uh, almost nothing from the bodybuilding world because it's mainly drugs uh, in there and genetics. I, you know, to be honest, I can't think of many books because my, my criteria for that is what book would I go out and buy right now that you've said that? Yeah. And I can't think of any that appeal to me enough that I go out and buy it. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah nice. discard, po- discard popular author books. I might say that. Do your own research. If if uh, if you find that uh, you know what I'm saying or what Doug says is uh, for, for whatever reason, if you doubt that, doubt the veracity of that, then blow it up. Boom. Go out and get some physiology textbooks. Find out how your body functions and experiment on your own. Um, and if you're really uh, pressed and just you know don't want any uh, to spend that kind of time, uh, look at, look at the work of Delorme and Watkins. Um, you know, from the uh, the mid '40s, I think, or late mid to late '40s, they're the guys that really laid the groundwork out. Arthur Steinhaus was a good physiology out of Illinois, who uh, who sort of amassed what was known about strength training uh, over the past couple hundred years. Uh, I read his textbook, which was very good. But uh, I'd almost recommend that as the first course because anyone else is selling something. You know, mm-hmm. everyone in the high intensity world, myself included, is selling something, and I think. The problem with that is you, you don't know, however eloquent the person is, you don't know if it's valid, you know. Um, yeah. I've endeavored to try and put forth the truth because it was never, uh, I, I mean, it was all new to me when I started writing it, and <clears throat> I didn't have any interest or any product to sell initially. Um, and that's uh, still the case. Uh, and that's why, I, you know, I think anything I say on the book front or what I've just said is suspect because two of the books uh, I'm a co-author of. So I would recommend um, looking, go to YouTube, forget the books, watch one of Doug's uh, talks. That'll give you a pretty good framework. And then take, you know, re-examine some of the, uh, the courses that came with your original barbell set and match that up with uh, what certain physiology textbooks and studies have to say. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I wish I had a better answer for no, it. That's I a feel fanta- I've kind of been lame on No, no, no. That's a fantastic uh, answer because what you're saying is pe- people need to learn how to discern good from bad yeah. um, and be able to pick the right sources and that's a challenge in itself. And you, like you say, going onto YouTube and checking out Doug's talks is a great segue into finding out you know, great information. And, yes, and, 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 and check what he said. Check the veracity of what Doug says. Uh, there was a, actually, there was a fellow named Paul Ingram who has a website in, on the west coast of Canada, and he did a review on Body by Science, and he, he went at it initially, saying, "Oh, the authors, oh, they must have cherry picked their their data and this and that." And then he yeah. went and did his own research, and he found out that wasn't the case. So that was to me that was nice because it was someone that went at it completely antagonistically, and then saw that the antagonism was unwarranted. Yeah, so that was a good thing, but uh, yeah, I just I I think anytime someone is has created a product, they're going to sell you on the product, and and I think that compromises them. So I would say don't listen or don't buy any of my books. Uh, don't uh, you know if what I say makes sense, then great. But otherwise, think for yourself. Huh. Go out and uh, huh. and match what I've said or what other people have said. And, and see if it's true. See if there's evidence for believing it. And then do what Mike said, which is get your ass in the Whatever is going to motivate you. It's set a fire under your ass. Get you in the gym and train hard. Yeah. That's a step in the right direction. And the harder you train, you're not going to be training very long. And then just don't train again until you need to. That's, it's almost a too simplistic uh, uh, strategy, but that's the reality of it. You know, there's, there's, it has been made complex and confusing by people who know the bullshit baffles brains. Yeah. So it shouldn't be that difficult. Um, it, you know, you're lifting a weight and you're putting it down. <laughs> I mean, this is rocket science. You know, it's not muscle tissue is not like the pancreas or the kidneys. It's not a complex uh, tissue. So um, treat, keep it in its proper place. Don't don't let it become the monster that runs your life. Yeah. Do you know, there's an amazing, I, I, when I listened to that interview you did on High Intensity Nation, you said something at the end, and I've actually, I'm going to paraphrase it because I thought it was, it was quote worthy. Um, and you said, 
And it links into what you're saying, which is you said, there is a danger inherent in standing too close to the river of another man's thoughts because it's very easy to get swept off the bank and carried away from yourself. Don't take on faith anything that anybody else says, but to discover for yourself the reasons that it that is true, then you'll develop as an individual. Don't parrot someone else. Don't rob yourself of the opportunity to actually learn something and to figure something out because the rewards from that are phenomenal and will spill over into every other aspect of your life. And I thought well, that's that... That's quite a quite memory you have. Oh, no, no. That, 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 <laughs> I remember that quote. I'm, re- I'm reading. I'm reading of Evernote right now, so it's. Uh, oh. <laughs> so no, it's not. It's not um, recorded to memory. Otherwise, I'd be. Um, yeah, that'd be very impressive. But um, yeah, no, That's I just. That's true. We, I mean, and I noticed that in myself in the Bruce Lee world, and even with Mike Menser, that some personalities are so large that it's so easy to get swept off into the current of their thought, and you leave yourself, and you become hollow that way um, and all you can do is parrot what other people say and you you just you become a, a an incomplete person I mean your your intellectual development is at least the equal of your muscular development uh, actually it's more than your muscular development by quite a stretch and it's important to find out what you think and what are your criteria for coming to conclusions on it and it's something that's sadly missing in in most arenas of human endeavor, we always look for people to follow. We always, we're much more comfortable with what we, well, as Bruce Lee said, we're, we're more comfortable with what we imitate than what we originate. And uh, because other people are, surely they have to be right. And, and, I, and from that perspective, yeah. uh, they must be smarter yeah. than us. They must, they must have access to knowledge that we don't. But I think it also harkens back, again, to the conservation of energy synd- syndrome, which is if I don't have to output that mental energy, don't. Let, I'll let you do it. You know, you, you put out that energy and you tell me what to think and, you know, I'll accept that. And, and it's not that we're lazy, which is often thrown at people who are, you know, disinclined to put a lot of energy. That's, that's a survival mechanism and it's in all of us to one degree or another. And, uh, uh, if, again, if we don't have to output the energy, the impulse is don't. And when it comes to exercise, the hard thing is, is getting that spark to make us do something that we inherently hate to do. It's not that we hate being physically active. That can, that's okay. It feels good. And, but to, to, to go right down the line of all of those fiber types and tap those high energy output fibers, um, that requires motivation. And it's, it's difficult to kindle that from within often um, unless your objective or your goal is clearly defined and that's really what you want to pursue. But, uh, and unfortunately, I think for people from my generation, who grew up believing that you could build an arm like Mike Menser if you just trained hard enough, or you could look like Arnold Schwarzenegger if you followed his routine. What we're seeing now is that genetics is the trump card. You know, some of us are never, ever going to look like that. And, uh, and unfortunately, if that's what your whole reason for existence going to the gym is, you're going to be a very frustrated, hollow person. Um, There's a lot more to life. And again, training should be an adjunct to your full development and human uh, potential, not the all consuming, you know, light in your life. It's you've got to you've got to uh, keep it in its proper perspective. Don't let it run rampant over you. Yeah. Yeah. I found myself making that mistake um, because I, I, you know, I I, I almost went full circle because I used to exercise. I used to be an absolute addict and I'd exercise eight to six times, uh, six to eight times a week, sometimes twice a day. Um, cause I play basketball as well. So, um, I used to do a ton of exercise and it, me- it meant that I had no time for anything else. So everything else in my life suffered. Um, and in fact, my, my story about this is on the website. It's kind of where, where everything started. Um, and then it wasn't until I come across Doug's, uh, 21 convention talk, um, you know, after body by science had been published that I was, you know, I came across this way of looking at exercise and everything changed overnight. You know, suddenly everything shrunk to, you know, one or two workouts a week. Um, and it just meant that I was able to achieve so much more. And you can see that in, in, per, in terms of my own career relationship success is, is, is taken off since then. Um, um, but I was just saying that um, I, having reduced from high volume to low volume, 
I because things I weren't necessarily progressing anymore, I then went back to okay, so maybe I'll do an extra workout in the week and have two workouts a week. And then I started basically I, I've come full circle and I started doing too much um frequency, um, which is a mistake because like yeah. I said, I need to I need to let the body, I need to look after the recovery side of the equation, as Doug would say, and um, ensure that I'm getting the right amount of sleep and hydration and nutrition and uh, minim- uh, managing stress, etc. Yeah, and don't and don't obsess over it. Um, you know, uh, the uh, I remember I used to be the same way back in the '70s. I'd work out every day if I could because that was what we were told we had to do. And I remember missing a family function because it was it was chest and back day. <laughs> and I look back now and I think. The hell was I thinking of? You know, like for what? And what was I? Sixteen? You know, and uh, you know, I was a no threat to any Mister Olympia competitor. Uh, um, so it was just a misplaced priority. But it was be- it was the problem inherent in the belief that anything is possible if you put your mind to it. it becomes your goal. You become a slave to your art. You go to the gym. And, you know, it's bound. You're bound to get these uh, these magical muscles. And uh, mm. you know, if there's other people thinking the same way now, I mean, I can save you a lot of time. It's, it shouldn't be that type of a priority for you. It's, it's important, and don't get me wrong, if you've got the potential to do it, that's great. But most of us don't. And I've said before, it's like we're quarter horses, yeah. but we subscribe to Clydesdale Monthly, and we see these massive horses in there, and we think, God, what do they do? You know, they were colts at one point, and we make the mistake of going to the Clydesdale and asking them what they do. And they say, well, I eat oats, and I pull beer wagons around, you know, for three or four hours a day. Great. You know, we do that as quarter horses. We ape their training program. And lo and behold, we never become uh, Clydesdales. We'll always be quarter horses because it's not in our genetic cards to be otherwise. And, uh, but we keep buying Clydesdale monthly. You know, we keep looking at these people for advice. And it doesn't translate. Be the best you you can be. It sounds like a silly thing to say, but, you know, we don't know what your potential is. And you won't know it if you lock yourself in only one, one aspect of your physiology. If it's all about how much muscle size you can build, uh, then you may never know if you have basketball talents, for example, or any one of another physical attributes, martial arts, uh, you name it. You know, you've got to be a little bit diversified. You know? Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's really good advice. John, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. We've, we've run over. Um, so I was just going to ask you one last thing, which is what is the best way for people to find out more about you? Because you're really hard to find on the internet, I've realized. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what they'd want to find out about. I'm not that interesting. Um, <laughs> probably Facebook. I have a Facebook uh, page, uh, but that's about it. Like I say, I'm not really selling anything. Um, so they're uh, welcome to look for me or not as, as, as they wish. Uh, well, I will link to all of the uh, resources you mentioned as well as your books because they're great books. Um, and you have a yeah. wealth of books on, on Amazon, which is uh, really impressive actually. And it'd be great sometime if you've, well, it'd be great to do a part two at some point in the future if you've got time um, to perhaps take a detour into some of that information. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'd be uh, happy to speak to you at any time, Lawrence. Oh, and the, the, I should mention there was one study that was pretty interesting I could send you the link to it at some point, where it basically showed that for some people, exercise of either stripe, aerobic or strength training, can have no effect whatsoever. So bear that in mind when you're starting to meet people who obsess about having to get to the gym. They could, uh, it could actually be moving them in the wrong direction if they are that uh, genetic stripe. So. Well, funny you should say that, John, because uh, I was talking to James Steele recently, and he said that there's another study that's recently been published which showed there is no such thing as a non-responder. So does that ah. not... <laughs> it so, completely flies in the face of the study that I saw. So. Well, shall we trade? And, trade study. And James is uh, far more conversant in that field than I am, so um, <laughs> I guess what we've got is two studies that cancel each other out. But there is... Uh, there, from what I've seen, that there are no responders, and in some cases, exercise made the person weaker. Really, which was intriguing. But uh, I mean, if nothing else, it might it might just bring a broader context to our discourse, which is that is something that is a gamble, shall we say, when you look at both of those, worth you know 100 percent of your mental investment seven days a week. I would say it's important, but not all important. You know. 
Yeah. And when he says, well, within this study, apparently, when he says there's no such thing as a non responder, he means that if you, you know, you're looking at a large number of markers of, of improvement. So obviously, muscle, lean muscle gain is only one, one marker, and cholesterol profiles and blood pressure and yeah. insulin sensitivity, et cetera. Well, that, 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 that context is absolutely right. I mean, you could have no, uh, I mean, there is going to be an effect from exercise. So in that respect, you are a responder. But you, you know, whether or not that's a desirable response, a negative response, right. you know, that's sort of a post facto observation you would have to make. But uh, there, uh, I forgot what my train of thought was going to be at that point. I'm I'm under caffeinated. <laughs> no worries. Well, look, look, John, we'll uh, we'll trade we'll trade articles. Um, I'll dig that one up and send it over to you. Um, but that's- look. Thanks very much for your time today. I'll uh, I'll let you get back to your to your day now, which is it's only early afternoon your side, isn't it? So I'm sure you've got plenty to do this afternoon. Probably. I think my wife will put me to work doing something. So I appreciate the respite. No worries. All right, John. All the best, and I'll speak to you in the future. Thanks very much, Lawrence. Take, Take care. care. Cheers. Bye. Bye now. This podcast is brought to you by HitUni.com. H-I-T-Uni.com. The best website for online personal training courses for high intensity training. So whether you want to become a top level high intensity training trainer, um, or you want to maximize your knowledge on the subject of high intensity training to optimize your results, check out hituni.com, add your desired course to cart and simply add the coupon code CW10 and you'll get a 10% discount. Thanks for your support.